let's look at two topics. First topic is going to be the electric field near and inside of a conductor, and the second topic will be currents. So two strange facts about conductors. Uh, near a conductor's surface, the electric field is perpendicular to that surface. Now remember that a conductor is a material which will allow negative charges to move around inside of it freely. So metals are a good example of conductors. So what I mean by that is if you have a conducting sphere, if you're close to the surface of that conducting sphere, then the electric field in that region will be perpendicular to the surface. We're not going to think about that one too much, just know that fact. Second one is that the electric field inside of a, an isolated conductor is zero. Okay, now why would that be? Well, let's imagine this, let's imagine a sphere, and let's imagine that it doesn't have a zero electric field. Let's imagine that it does have some kind of electric field inside of it. If it does have an electric field inside of it, then the charges are going to move. The charges are going to feel forces from that electric field, and the charges will redistribute themselves into another configuration. And if that new configuration also has an electric field, well, then the charges will redistribute themselves again. They will feel forces and move around. That will happen until the charges have moved around in such a fashion such that there's no electric field inside the conductor. When there's no more electric field inside the conductor, then everything is in equilibrium because there's no more electric field to cause a force on any of the charges. And it will be static, and stationary, and the charges will remain that way. Now, the way that I've described it, it makes it sound like if there's an electric field in there, then, you know, the charges move around and there's a new field, and then they move around and there's a new field, and they keep doing that over and over and over again until there's no field. In fact, the process is very, very fast. The charges will redistribute themselves almost immediately so that there is zero field inside of a conductor. Okay, so I mentioned charges moving around inside of a conductor. That is given a name. If when charges move or flow through a conductor, that's called a current. A current is the flow of charge. Uh, it's given the symbol capital I, weird, okay? And it has the unit A, capital A for ampere. The ampere, let's note, the ampere is one of the fundamental SI units. So in the SI system, there's seven fundamental units. The ampere is one of them. The key equation for current is current is equal to delta Q over delta T. Delta Q means the charge that's passing by a point, And delta T is how much time it takes for that charge to go by. So if you're looking at a point in a conductor, and usually we're talking about wires, so metal conducting wires here. If three coulombs of charge pass through this little conducting wire every five seconds, then the current is equal to the amount of charge that passed by three coulombs divided by five seconds. So the current is equal to 0 0.600 amps. And if you look at this, if you look at the units, turns out an amp is equal to a coulomb per second. Okay, amp is equal to a coulomb per second. So then the next question would be, well, current is the flow of charge. Does it have a direction? The answer is yes. The, the current is given a direction, and the current is the flow of positive charge, the direction of flow of positive charge. So if you have a bunch of little positive charges and they're traveling to the right, the current is to the right. Trick is, if you have a bunch of negative charges and the negative charges are moving to the right, turns out the current is to the left because these are negative charges. Current is the direction that positive charges would flow. If negative charges are flowing to the right, then that means positive charges would flow to the left. We'll look at this a little bit more later on. But let's imagine what's physically happening inside of a wire. So I'm gonna draw a big cylinder and imagine that we're looking at a close-up of an electrical wire. Maybe it's made out of copper or aluminum, whatever. And the wire, whatever metal it is, it's made up of little atoms. So I'm gonna draw the little atoms that are inside of this metal wire. Um, the things that are physically moving are electrons. These are called free electrons, these ones that are moving. Free electrons, or sometimes they're called conduction electrons, or they're also called charge carriers. 
But these are the things, these are the charges, which are physically moving in the wire, which cause a current to be present. And when I draw them, notice that I'm going to draw their little velocity vectors, each little electron's velocity vectors. They don't all move in the same direction or at the same speed. Some are fast, some are slow. Some go forward, some go backward. But on average, they're moving as a group to the right in this picture. Um, and these fixed atoms in there, these things that are the fixed atoms in the wire, the conducting materials atoms, they don't move. They're stationary, right? They're part of the material of the wire, so they're stuck there in the wire. Uh, it's just the electrons that are moving. And I'm also going to draw at the end of the cylinder, I'm going to highlight this little area. Um, and that's a circular area, if we have a cylinder. And we're going to call that the cross-sectional area of the wire. It's kind of like if, if you have a big cylinder, that's the area of the top of the cylinder. All right. So I said that some of the electrons are moving fast, some are moving slow, some are moving forward, backward. The drift speed is the average speed of these charge carriers or electrons in a wire. So it's the average of all of this. It's taking into account that some are fast, some are slow, some are moving in one direction, a couple are moving in the other direction. And the equation for this, I'm going to write it down, is that the current is equal to NAVQ. Let's go through each of those. So I, clearly, that's the current in the wire. N, that's the number of charge carriers per cubic meter in the material. So the number of charge carriers per cubic meter in the material. Uh, it's also, it's kind of a density, right? Because it's per cubic meter. It's number of charge carriers per cubic meter. Uh, that number right there is often given because that depends on the type of material. Copper has a certain number of charge carriers per material, per cubic meter. Uh, aluminum has a different number of charge carriers per tungsten would have a different value for that. Okay. Uh, a is the cross-sectional area of the wire in square meters. So that cross-sectional area that I drew on that previous diagram, that's what I'm talking about here. V is the drift speed of the charge carriers. So that's the average speed of the charge carriers. And then Q represents the charge on each of those charge carriers. So normally we're talking about electrons being the charge carriers, so Q would represent the charge on each electron, which is the fundamental charge, 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And this equation is a scalar equation. It does not tell you about direction, so you don't put uh, a negative charge into there and you know don't put a negative drift speed or anything like that because um, it's a speed speed doesn't have direction so it wouldn't be negative um, but yeah remember this equation gives you magnitude it's a scalar equation it doesn't tell you anything about direction direction you have to get another way